Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. My name is AJ Retker. I'm the author of Oathbreaker, and I'm joined today by Nicholas Eames, author of Kings of the Wild and the Band series. Thank you so much for joining me today, Nicholas, or Nick. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So first things first, I got to ask, can you give us a quick elevator pitch for Kings of the Wild? Like for those who haven't read it. Yeah, yeah. Kings of the Wild uh, takes place in a setting where uh, mercenary bands of four or five uh, men or women um, have, uh, you know, they kill monsters. They they uh, basically achieve, achieve the notoriety of rock stars. So they uh, they have managers, they get booked gigs, but those gigs are to slay dragons or rescue princes or you know, save this town from goblins or what whatnot. And between those gigs, they drink and smoke and act like hooligans and pretty much, you know, do what celebrities in, in our day and age do. Um, so yeah, it takes place in that setting. And the first book is about a band that used to be the biggest band in the world. They've since gone their separate ways and got, uh, you know, old or fat or drunk or a combination of the three. And, uh, and then one of them whose daughter is a mercenary in her own right, um, is kind of gets trapped in a city halfway across the world. So they get, get the old band back together to go rescue her. So that's nice. kind of the premise, pretty classic rock and roll story. Yeah. I know as I, as I was reading it, there was so many parallels to rock and roll. I was like, and that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, it's su such a unique idea to have combined fantasy with like rock and roll. And how did you come up with that idea? How did that come to fruition? Um, I was high as a kite. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> But it, I always joke that it's the kind of idea that you come up with in your high. You're like, man, what if like mercenary bands and rock bands were the same thing? And then you'd like laugh and then go, OK, I'll never, never, ever write that. But um, I had just read um, Ready Player One, mm -hmm. um, which is like in itself kind of a love letter to the things that that person loves, like 80s music and 80s movies and things like that. And uh, and it got me listening to the band Rush because um, there's a huge Rush reference in that book. Um, and listening to Rush, like their music, especially their 70s music, is so ingrained with fantasy. Like it's talking about, you know, magical swords and quests and fountains and wars and stuff like that. And and then a lot of fantasy or a lot of sorry, music from that age kind of is as well. Like Led Zeppelin's got mm -hmm. some Lord of the Rings references in there. Um, there's just so much of it in there. And so kind of listening to that music a bit more, I think, is how the idea kind of struck me. And I thought for sure someone had done it already. You know, like I'd seen it, obviously, there's a, a video game called Brutal Legend that's kind of like that. Um, but I just thought someone had done it for sure. So I Googled it and no one had. So I thought, you shut your mouth and write this book, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> done before someone else does. So um, I think it's an idea that, I, honestly, if it had occurred to anyone, I mean, I'm sure it did occur to someone because how could it not? Um, I think anyone could write a great book based on that premise. Uh, and I, I hope that I did too. So, uh, yeah. you know, I really like it. And, just for those who are watching, if you have any questions, be sure to throw them in the chat and we'll get to them as well. It saves me from talking a little bit and my voice getting sore as I'm yelling at my family from as we're developing my basement right now. Um, but yeah, uh, my friends love, they've never read your book, but they love the world you do because I have made a DD and d campaign based off your book. Awesome. So they have made their own little band and they've gone around, they've met Clay and everyone else in the book. And Very cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, my friends are a lot more chaotic than your characters and a lot more morally yeah. flexible because yeah. that's just the way they play. But yeah. uh, it's it, they really love the book and like, man, like this is such a great concept. Like, and they all asked to read your book, so like it's going through my friend group right now. So I, 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 also, yeah. I, I, I would show it. But. I think it's a pretty good, a pretty ripe for that, just because I mean, obviously, it's kind of inspired by that. It takes pretty. Um, you know, liberally from Dungeons and Dragons as far as like the monsters go and stuff like that. Um, and it's one of those things where when writing it, like I'm I'm forever trying to convince people that don't read fantasy books to read fantasy books. Mm -hmm. And although I love a book where someone invents everything and comes up with everything new and there's no such thing as orcs or goblins and things like that in it. Um, and God, when I was in my mid thirties, like I would never have touched a book if, you, if I knew there was a goblin in it. I thought I was way too fucking cool for that. Um, <laughs> And, but when it came to writing this, I was like, you know what, if I just, if I make up, I was trying to write a book that say like, you know, my, my mom would like it, even if she wasn't my mom or that you could recommend to anyone and get them to read it. And I feel like that if someone who doesn't read fantasy, you know, comes across this word and it's like a bliggle thorn and they're just going to be like, no, peace. I'm out. Um, but if it's goblin, they're like, I hate this, but I know what a goblin is. So I'll keep reading it. 
Um, and so at least to, be, to begin with, I kind of tried to keep it as classic as possible and, and use those kind of classic D and D monsters that maybe not everybody knows, but, but lots of people do. And so, yeah, that's fair enough. So that kind of leads me to another question that I have further down the list, but we'll get to it now. Cause we're kind of on the topic. Where do you stand on the trope debate? Are they crutches for authors or are they helpful for authors to use to kind of get to a wider audience? Like you said. Yeah, I don't think it matters whatsoever. Like I'm not, I'm not picky whatsoever about tropes or what goes into like a book. It's just all that matters to me really is how the story is told. So, you know, use whatever tropes you want. Like people are all like these days are kind of like, we've gone so far away from like the farm boy trope, even though it's kind of considered the biggest trope. Um, mm -hmm. There's, you couldn't fucking find a book nowadays, almost no books written from the farm boy, unless they're written ironically now, almost. Um, and so, yeah, I'm all for them. I'm all for them. Yeah. yeah. There's even, I've seen on Reddit, some people uh, reviewing, you know, my book or someone else's book. And there's some lines that people like, just they hate certain sentences that authors use. Like, uh, what was it? Uh, oh yeah. He let out a breath. He didn't know he was holding. Someone yeah. was like, I hate when authors use this book or use this thing and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you write a goddamn book then and don't you yeah. try not to use that phrase. It's pretty good. Yeah. You know, it works really well. Or uh, something I, I'm guilty of his eyes. Like his, his stare was as hard as steel or something. And yeah. I use that. And if I have the editors come like, this is like the fifth time you've used it in this book. You have to think of something better to use. I'm like, oh, yeah. I you mean, you got to definitely space out your uses of these things. But uh, yeah. And I'm like, I'm big on that too. If I use like a big word, a really good word um, and I want to use it again in the same book. It's got to be either like my favorite word in the whole world is inexorable. Um, and I use it, I think, in chapter two of Kings of the Wild. And it, I wanted to use it throughout the whole book. But I was like, I would measure it against that first use of inexorable. And I'm like, there's no fucking way I'm using this. Like I never would never use it three times in one book. But I was like, I got to space it out. So every single use of my word of inexorable was weighed against whether it would be better than that one. So. Yeah, that's just how I am with my first draft. I don't, I fall into habits and so easily when I write yeah. my book. Yeah. And then thankfully, I have a good editor because yeah. <laughs> otherwise, it would just be, oh, this guy's just lazy as hell. Yeah, you definitely got to watch the, the reusing of things. But, you know, as far as using it once, like whatever, just use it, you know? It's, yeah. yeah. Uh, question for Nick, for Nick here. Uh, oh, if I can show it. There we go. Uh, was it easy to switch to a more emotional story in Blood Ro Bloody Rose than I'm assuming compared to Kings of the Wild? Um, yeah, I felt so. Um, granted, like that's kind of the style of writing that I use in these books, at least is, is kind of my own voice. And for a lot of writers, it's a struggle to find that. I know for me, it was a huge struggle to find that. Cause I, for years, I was trying to emulate my favorite authors and wrote, you know, this giant monstrous epic fantasy book that will never be published. That was not, you know, funny whatsoever, but it tried really hard to be emotional. And just in general, I'm, I'm a pretty, um, you know, I try to be funny, um, whether or not I succeed. And I'm definitely emotional as anyone who's watched me watch a sad commercial can attest. Um, I ball my eyes out constantly at anything. So writing Bloody Rose was like, it's a more emotional story, but, uh, but I loved it. And it's uh, when people obviously respond to like comedy and fantasy, it's great. But when they respond to the poignant scenes, then that's obviously even more rewarding to me, at least. Um, yeah. Yeah. Bloody Rose is definitely a naturally more poignant story. Right. That was one thing I did notice when I read Kings of Wild was like how, and I love it because like it was kind of dark humor. And I yeah. was like, I caught myself several times laughing out loud, which I never do with books. Like there's been times like usually when I read a book and the author tells a joke, it falls flat for me. But for, for you, for whatever reason, I was yeah. just like, oh man, it just it crushed it. Well, thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Have you read uh, Have you read The Black Time Thief? Oh, I got partly through it, and then because my ADHD, I was like, "Ooh, a new book!" And I immediately yeah. tossed it to the side and started reading a new book, and I haven't got back to it yet. Because that book, boy, I laughed out almost every page. I was like, with I was in someone in the same room, I was like, "Oh my god, you got to hear this sentence! You got to hear this sentence!" And I recently reread it because um, I wrote a foreword. It's got a special edition coming out that I wrote a foreword for. And I, in the first three, the first chapter alone, I probably laughed out loud three times. Like it's just, it kills me. Yeah. Yeah. Christopher Bielman. I think that's how I pronounce his last name. Just does an awesome job of that. But I loved what I read. I just haven't finished it. 
Yeah, but you're right. But humor is a tricky thing. And I'm the same as you. Like, I'll read someone will be like, oh, so-and-so said something. And everyone in the room laughed. I'm like, did they now? Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like, a, yeah, just a statement more than a joke. But yeah. you guys, yeah. Suck it up. Comment, uh, are you going to Worldcon in Chicago? Hey, good question. I am actually going to Worldcon in Chicago. I, uh, my, my original editor was going and I, I missed the last one and not the last one, but the one in Dublin that I really, really wanted to go to. Um, mm. And so I will not regret it again, damn it. So um, <laughs> I don't know if yet if I'm doing any panels, I've filled out um, my like the program form and what you want to be on and stuff like that. Um, and so I think they start kind of tomorrow kind of, or the day after tomorrow kind of figuring out who's on what panel. So well, whether I get in any panels, we'll see, but I'll definitely be there to drink in the, in the bar. Nice. Yeah. Right on. So uh, who are some of your biggest influences as a writer? Um, well, God, I mean, anyone who's ever watched me for an interview on more than 10 minutes has heard me rant about Guy Gabriel K and how I think he's the greatest writer of all humankind. So he is probably my biggest influence. Uh, he was probably the reason I tried to write a super serious book for 10 years and failed at it. Um, so I was trying to be really eloquent. Um, if there are any eloquent scenes in Kings of the Wild or Bloody Rose, they are due to his influence. Um, but also it was more authors like Joe Abercrombie and Scott Lynch that when I read them, their, their books are so funny and so full of humor. Like Joe Abercrombie, he doesn't necessarily try to be funny. His characters don't always tell jokes, but I think he's funny like on every single page. Like it's just every single sentence almost is infused with like this kind of dark iron irony that is just brilliant i think so it was authors like that that made me kind of think maybe i could write a book that's tries a bit harder to be funny um at the time i hadn't read any um like terry pratchett i honestly didn't know it existed like i knew it existed but i didn't know how funny it was mm -hmm. um so yeah those were the two authors that made me go okay maybe maybe there's room for humor and fantasy what about you me, my big one is definitely Andrew Sapkowski, author of the Witcher series. If anyone's yeah. read my first book, oh, like a lot of people said, this is so like Witcher adjacent. And yeah. I was like, that's because I was a huge fan of him. And like, yeah, he's like the only come. book, he's the only book I've really done. Like I've been like five out of five stars because five out of five means I drop all my social obligations and I can't put the book down. Wow. And like, he, and like uh, I got all the Witcher series for Christmas one year. And this is when I was home from Toronto and my family didn't see me for like three days. And I devoured all six books in like three days. Wow. And it was like, Oh, Great you're home. Too. Yeah. I got started on the games and then I was like, okay, yeah. I got it. I love the games. Like I got to know more about this world. I got to know the backstory. So I read all the books then played all the games and now I'm going to the TV show as well. So it's just, yeah. it's just nuts. And then obviously you know, Tolkien's a big influence. Of mine, Anthony Ryan, who I was lucky enough to have on the channel, was another big influence of mine. So just yeah. those kind of guys have been really big for me. I never really read Grim Dark. I know my book qualifies as Grim Dark. So like Joe yeah. Abercrombie, some of the big Grim Dark names, I've never really read. And oh really? Just, wow. Yeah, I just I didn't know Grim Dark was really even a genre. And then yeah. my one friend who read my book, who was the first person who read my book, they're like, oh, this is a grim, dark fantasy. You would like Joe Abercrombie yeah. and Michael Fletcher yeah. and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, what the hell is grim, dark? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to imagine someone. I mean, I, they're out there, I'm sure. But someone not liking Joe Abercrombie, he's he's like the one of the one of the best people mm. working in fantasy today. Uh, and if you ever decide to give his books a shot, um, I cannot recommend the audiobooks enough. Um I only started listening to audiobooks like when I had an audiobook, and now I, I'm never with that, not with it, not with one, not without one. Mm -hmm. Never, anyways. <laughs> um, I'm stupid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're not editors, it's fine. For his second to last book, um, I had heard great things about his narrator, so I decided to listen to it. And I don't think I'll ever read on paper another one of his books again. Like, it just his narrator is astoundingly good. So. Yeah. Another question from Universe Fantasy. Do you have any input in translation in other languages other for your books? Um, not necessarily. Certain translations, certain um, people who are working on it will contact me occasionally and ask me questions about stuff. Um, usually not, but a few of them have. The only kind of exception was um, 
the Spanish uh, one because that was done by a, a guy who was, we were kind of a, a friends on Twitter. And when he found out that I was getting a Spanish translation, he was like, listen, I'm a translator. Can you get them to um, like ask them if I can do it or like put my name in for it anyway. And he had done some pretty big books already. Um, and so sure enough, he did it. And so when it came to translating, he would constantly email me with like questions, whether like it was getting a rock reference right, but but changing it to Spanish or getting it like, say, Larkspur, I have a character named Larkspur who's named after a poisonous flower. He would find a different poisonous flower that also sounded cool to use in Spanish. Spanish. So of all the translations, I feel like that's probably the, the closest to the original text. And um, from, what I've, from what I've heard, people have really, really loved it. So nice. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I have no experience in that whatsoever. My book's only in English. So sorry, yeah. other <laughs> other language speakers. You're kind of crap out of luck for my book. But um, what uh, what was your publishing journey like? Excuse the developing noise. Anyone who was watching, you can probably just hear the saw going downstairs. But yeah, what was your publishing journey like? Um, I, well, as I said, I wrote another, I worked on another book for, like 10 to 12 years almost when I was 25 years old, I started it. And, uh, and it was like a big fat, serious fantasy epic. Um, and when I finished it, I think it was around 350,000 words to begin with. Um, and so I like trimmed it down, um, kind of rewrote it after that, but that first draft probably took me six or eight years or something like that. I was working in restaurants at the time. And then, uh, I sent, started sending it out to agents. It got rejected by quite a few and uh and so and most of them were just like this is way too big because fantasy's kind of been paring itself down for the most part um and so i cut it i ended up cutting it in half and uh rewriting the first half so it kind of felt like a regular book and then while i was sending that out to get rejected a second time um i, I wrote kings of the wild um and i had actually written the first three chapters to kings of the wild a year before that and just had, when I came up with the idea, I wrote the three chapters. And I'm like, okay, this this might be kind of cool, but I got to work on this giant fantasy epic. So, um, while that was racking up more rejections, I wrote Kings of the Wild, um, and definitely knew while I was writing it that I was on to something a bit, you know, more so than with my last book, just because I think I learned a lot of lessons. I was finally writing in a voice that was mine, as opposed to one that was emulating other people. Um, and then I kind of lucked out because, um, well, I was like in a restaurant that I was working at, um, there was an author named Sebastian de Castell that wrote the Trader's Blade. He's also Canadian who actually came into my restaurant and I saw his name on the reservation list and I asked that he'd, he'd be put in my section. And, uh, and so I, I talked to him and we shot the shit and he was like super gracious and, and, uh, told him I was writing a fantasy book. I was about halfway done at the time. Um, and then when I'd finished it, um, there was an agent that was kind of interested enough in my old book to say, send me whatever you write next. So by then, the next time Sebastian came into my restaurant, uh, this agent and I were going back and forth on stuff. And it wasn't quite a yes, wasn't quite a no. Um, but eventually that agent and I parted ways. And um, then Sebastian came in again and was like, well, and, he, and that agent was a pretty big agent. So he knew that the book couldn't be that terrible. Um, and so he offered to pass it on to his agent and, and, uh, his agent ended up taking me on. So nice. Uh, yeah. So we, we kind of cut the book down at the time from like 120,000 words to a hundred thousand words. And then about six months, six or eight months later, we had two different offers, one of them being from orbit. Um, and so that's the one I took just because, you know, the vision of that, the editor was more in line with what the book was, um, and uh, then, then they wanted me to add 50,000 words to it, which is pretty rare. So I got to add, you know, kind of flesh out the world a bit more. Otherwise, it was pretty bare bones. Um, and, and yeah, bingo, bango. Nice. Yeah. Come, come true. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Just funny how the life works out like that just by luck of the draw. Yes. Yeah. It, it's extremely fortunate. And also, it just a matter, it's a matter of like finding, you know, the right, agent at the right time and the right editor at the right time because you know those two offers that came in that i mentioned like one of them had a very drastically different version of the book that was essentially like a joe abagrambi 2.0 i think traditional publishing has a tendency to they want you know and rightly so they want to be make safe bets and so they want mm -hmm. to bet on something that's been successful before and try to find books that emulate it 
uh, and that can reach the same audience and appeal to the same audience. So um, luckily the, the editor from Orbit, you know, she thought that what Kings of the Wild was, that maybe there was a place for it. Like that was a bit more lighthearted, a bit more funny. So nice. thank you gods, both those offers yeah. came at the same time because I probably would have just taken the other one, you know, because yeah. I've sense. been working for quite some time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, that going. That being said, do you have any advice for new authors or people thinking about writing a book or maybe have a book half written or? Yeah, I mean, basically, like I mean, some people write that first book and it's just perfect, you know, or close to it right off the bat. Um, and you know, I thought that I was going to be that person. You know, okay, everyone kind of thinks that they're the exception to the rule, and I totally thought that was me and. And it wasn't. And and not to say that isn't you as well, because it damn well could be. But, um, but you know, if I, I sometimes wonder if I had just given up on that first book and started something new earlier, might I have found success earlier? Maybe not, because maybe I couldn't have written the book that was Kings of the Wild yet. But, um, you know, don't be afraid to, like, shelf a book and start something new, because so many authors that I talk to, you know, they're like, oh, I wrote five or six books before. I got wrote one that got me published and I, you know, it's baffling to some people, but sometimes that's what it takes. So yeah. don't be afraid to like start fresh and, you know. Yeah. And I, I feel that. Cause like my first book, Oathbreaker I released and it received a lukewarm reception yeah. and, and some people who like liked it, liked it. And people who hated it, hated it, obviously. Uh, but the people who liked it, like, we want the sequel. We want the sequel. Cause I left it on a big cliffhanger yeah. and then me being the genius that is career direction, career marketing. I'm like, I'm going to write a different book next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally new and make you wait for it. And so now my second book's coming out in a couple months. Yeah. But, and it's not at all Oathbreaker sequel. So those fans yeah. are going to be incredibly disappointed. So yeah, I just felt like sometimes you just get those mindsets where like, I have to write this book now. Like yeah, how did that feel writing that second one? Did it feel like you like improved or leveled up? Oh yeah, this book is so much stronger, and yeah. I think I say that every time I release a book because I think I'm just going to get better as I keep yeah. progressing. But it, yeah, I just felt like even my my mentor Sky, who recently published her own books, she uh, basically was like you've improved so much in the course of the last like year. Like this book is phenomenal compared to Oathbreaker, and Oathbreaker was a yeah. decent book. So. Yeah. Well, it's great. Right. Finds like I mean, hopefully, some of the people that read your first book will go over to this one, and yeah. you could find a whole new audience. You know, like yeah, I don't want to toot my own horn because we're interviewing you, not me. So <laughs> oh, toot away, man, toot away. Yeah. Uh, do you have any formal writing background? Nope, nope. I uh, yeah, no. I was I was busy writing during English class, so I didn't learn what the hell an adverb is. You know, I. <laughs> I just, I couldn't tell you. And so many times people were like, oh, you know, a subjective, I could, this could not even be a thing, but say a subjective noun. I don't know what, what it is. It could be gibberish, but I have no clue about any of that. Um, but I know what a good sentence looks like, I think. And I know what a bad sentence looks like, I think. I do now. I wrote a lot of bad <laughs> ones in my life and still do. But, um, but yeah, no, I don't have any training, just kind of, you know, 12 years of trial and error. Yeah, that's yes. kind of what I had to. It's always funny. I always ask authors that because some people are like, oh, I have a bachelor's in English or I was always writing. And then you get the authors like me and you and then a couple others who are like, I just learned how to write a good story from Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And know and how I, to get a good plot hook. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what's what's really important. Although, I mean, it couldn't, education never hurts. And, you know, you're going to mm -hmm. start off. There's a lot of people, obviously, like I've read samples of, you know, people's already work that's, they just don't, and it's, it's baffling how many people, you know, have read so many books, but then they try to write and you realize they don't actually understand how a sentence kind of works. Um, and so it, it obviously it takes some, you know, when you read books, I, I, and I always have, I think just paid close attention to them, like mm. the structure of them things like that. I mean, yeah. Like when I'm reading books, I always read once for pleasure and two for dissection. Yeah. And I just, I'm able to turn off that analytical side of my head and just read for fun. And then I go back and scour and highlight and mark, mark up the books. Yeah. I kind of try to do that at the same time because I don't have time to read books twice, but that's true. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I can be, that can be pretty critical, I think, sometimes. Uh, do you read much or are you more preoccupied with writing? Like, do you still have to find time to sit down with a book and then? Oh yeah. I read all the time. I, I mean, granted, I'm not like the poster boy for productivity. I'm fucking terrible at it, but, uh, but I've heard a lot of authors say that they don't, you know, they don't have time to read once they start their writing careers. And, uh, that's not why I started writing so I could obliterate every other love of my life. You know, like Mm -hmm. if I couldn't read, I wouldn't write period that's stupid to me. (laughs) Um, you know, I love reading is what made me want to write in the first place. So, um, I don't really see the point of stopping to do, to do the thing that that inspired you to do that, you know, just because, so you can do it too. Uh, if, you know, if it works and you, and you find enough joy in writing, then that's great. But to me, I, I read pretty voraciously. I usually read and always have kind of first thing in the morning, every morning. Uh, is there anything that you've read recently that you've really enjoyed that you can, um god yeah what was like or i mean as i said the black tongue thief was friggin phenomenal it was Mm -hmm. great um i also was very fortunate enough to get um an early advanced copy of guy gabriel k my favorite author is the new book that comes out on the 22nd of this month called all the seas of the world and it was as usual heartbreakingly beautiful and yeah perfectly written nice that was pretty great yeah I just yeah I've I've always a big like like you said I think you mentioned earlier audiobooks and like I was never an audiobook person yeah and and then my book got put into an audiobook and I was like yeah. oh man this is so nice I can listen to while I drive yeah and now I never like sit down and read a book it's always audiobooks Audio, audiobooks yeah. yeah I mean I yeah I definitely do kind of prefer the act of reading but like I said too I'm always never without an audiobook it wow. just it, it always sucks for me though because sometimes like you just get an absolute abysmal narrator and the book's amazing just right. monotone and i'm like oh, a little inflection man yeah there's a battle it's, scene you don't read it like you're preaching a sermon yeah it's really hit or miss so there's definitely some books out there that i've wanted to try to tackle like it's a great way to tackle you know more books a year but uh you listen to the narrator for a few minutes and you just can't stand it um and the same goes, sometimes I have a real issue with the way some male narrators do female voices. Just mm-hmm. bugs it. I'm like, don't, you don't have to change your voice. Women sound just like us. Stop it. Just use yeah. your voice, you know, um, which is, yeah, which is like, I, I kind of, you know, not, not everyone is lucky enough to get the choice. But uh, when it came to my second book, which has a female main character, I was like, I bet I was like, I love the guy that did the voice of my first book, but I'm like, please, please make it a female character, a female narrator, because that would be absurd. Mm-hmm. So that makes I, sense. Yeah, yeah, thankfully they did it. Well, that's good. So you kind of got to choose your narrator then once you're with uh, or... I got like a small choice with the first time around. It was just like, hey, is this guy cool? I'm like, sure. <laughs> um, by then, I, re- I was realizing I had less choice uh, than I thought because I sure as heck didn't choose the title. Um, although I love it. Um, yeah. but, but the second time around, you know, they, they were really kind enough to acquiesce to my request of a female narrator. And then they, they sent me two different possibilities and they're like, what do you think of these two? So they were both fantastic. The one I didn't choose had narrated some books that I absolutely loved, but the one I did choose had kind of like, I was looking for someone that could do that sounded youthful that had kind of like a, a, almost a, not a sarcastic edge, but I had an, a youthful edge to her voice mm-hmm. uh, that she could bring to the main character and the titular character Rose. Um, so I think, and she was like, absolutely perfect. And more so than that, um, surprised me during the really poignant parts that she just nailed it, like nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. Yes. She is the perfect voice for that book, I thought, I think. Yeah, I know for my audio book, when I went through Oathbreaker, I went through probably about 40 to 50 because I went through ACX, Amazon's independent because yeah. I'm self-published, obviously. Yeah. Um, I picked a guy. He did the audio book. He's about to send it off to me. Hard drive crashed and corrupted. Lost oh, everything. God. Yeah. Lost all 11 hours of it. And then he just said, I said, okay, can you re-record? He's like, no, I don't want to. So I'm like, Jesus. <sighs> so I was like, all right, let me, let me find another narrator then. Yeah. And luckily I found Matt and Matt does an absolutely outstanding job. Everyone who's listened to the audiobooks like this guy's phenomenal. Would yeah. you pay him? And I'm like, not enough. <laughs> wow. Not enough for what he did. So I obviously yeah, Matt's crushed. Mistake, then. Yeah. Very fortunate mistake. Just, wow. but yeah, holy crap. But yeah, that's kind of my audiobook nightmare. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really nice to be able to choose 
uh, who does your audiobook. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, like, like I said, I didn't, uh, I, I originally, my original title for the book was just the band. Um, and they were like, we're not going to call it that. And I'm like, I think it should. And uh, <laughs> we went back and forth on many, many titles. In the meantime, they kind of, they went out and got like my favorite cover artist of all time, Richard Anderson to do the cover. So that kind of like, once that happened, I kind of rolled over on everything else. I'm like, you call it whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh, nice. Now that you got him. So. Right on. So I got to ask, do you have a favorite character in Kings of the Wild or the band series? Do you have a um, favorite? Yeah, there's, there's like, oof, it's, it's, it is hard to choose. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously I'm pretty impar like partial to the, the narrators, both narrators um, because they're both kind of different sides of me, obviously like, um, Clay is the one closer to me in, well, I wouldn't say physical appearance, but we share the same gender anyway. Um, you know, but he's got that dry kind of like sarcasm kind of sometimes dry that I've got, um, and a, a, an optimistic and pessimistic view of things, um, that kind of think be kind of, it, it makes a, makes for a funny narrator. Um, and then Tam definitely in the second book has like the sentimental side of me and the, you know, the, the wonderment kind of thing. And, um, so I do really, I do love both of them, but also in each book, there's a character that I use kind of like as a, a basically as a mouthpiece for whatever absurd joke I want to say. Um, and so in the first book, it's Moog, who's my pajama wearing wizard. Um, and then in the second book, it's Roderick, who's, uh, kind of like, he's their, their, their manager, their booker. And if there's anything that I just want someone to blurt and try to get, get away with it, it's, it's those two characters. So yeah, I love them both. Yeah, I know my friends, anyways, in the DD campaign love Moog. They're like, We want to recruit him in our band. I'm like, sorry, he's in the saga. Yeah. But they really loved him and they loved Maddie too. Yeah, yeah. Matrick is I feel like sometimes sometimes I think feel like Matrick slips through the cracks as a character just because he's not as like stand out sometimes as some of the others. Um mm -hmm. when he's put in the group with the others, but um but yeah, I love them both. And then I really, really, really love the bad guy from the first book, Last Leaf. Um, yeah who you know he's just he's just like cool as shit he's very very he's inspired by kind of david bowie um and yeah he's pretty he's pretty wicked too right so are you more of a planner or a pantser do you plan everything out on like notepads or do you go by the seat of your pants um i am the latter the pantser i i definitely i i think i used to kind of plan everything out um and i think maybe a lot of new authors try that you know they make their map first and then you know make the whole magic system first and then make the whole world first and then start writing uh but for me and that's what i did the first time around but with kings of the wild i just wrote um you know it's it's a it's a very point a to point b book because they're obviously going to rescue this guy's daughter so you if you don't know by the end of chapter three where the book ends you haven't been reading um mm. so I want to make the way there as, you know, as interesting as possible. So I tried to write it so that every two or three chapters, I would think to myself, okay, what's, what's going to happen next? What's the very, the obvious thing. And then try to make it the exact opposite of that. Uh, so try to just add as many sudden changes in there as possible. And I think it makes it fun to read and it certainly makes it more fun to write. What about you? I'm a pantser too. I don't plan anything. Yeah. I mean, I I always I've said this in multiple interviews and stuff. Like, I if you ever watched the Dark Knight with the, I think yeah, I think it's the Dark Knight with the Joker, the Batman yeah. movie. Yeah. Batman or Joker says, "I'm like a dog chasing cars. I don't know what I'd ever do if I caught one. I just do things, and that's kind of my approach to writing. Yeah. I'm just like, ooh, let's try this and throw it into the story okay. and see how it sticks. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting, obviously uh, to see another pastor because everyone I've really talked about says, Oh, I plan everything out. Oh, really? Yeah. There's very few people I've had on the channel who said, Oh, I, I pants. Yeah. God, I think I, I feel like I've met more pantsers than plotters, but I am jealous of the plotters because they always seem supremely confident in what they're doing. And, yeah, and, you know, and sometimes they write these, like they write, uh, like a plan, an outline that's 30,000 words. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes time for them to write the book, it goes pretty smoothly. So uh, maybe I should become a plotter because, yeah. <laughs> well, Clayton Snyder, I don't know if you're familiar with his work at all. Yeah. Uh, he just posted on Twitter the other day. I think he said he had like a 300 page outline for his next book. I'm like, that's a whole novel, man. Yeah. Well, when I first moved, I live in Victoria now and I, I uh, 
met up with, I knew him before from online, but uh, met up with Ben Galley, who's this other self-published author. Uh, we became pretty great friends over the course of one single beer. Um, and uh, and yeah, he's a, he, I got, I got to see his like kind of behind the scenes of how much he plots and he's got these like, you know, like so many different like things on like, you know, behind the scenes in his world that's just fascinating to see. So um, yeah, it's, it's really cool when you see someone's behind the scenes stuff on that. Yeah. So what would you say is the hardest part about writing a book? Um, I think maybe just applying yourself to doing it. Um, I'm finding for whatever reason, this third time around, like my mind just kind of bounces off it. The idea of writing sometimes it's just like, it's just not going to happen. I'll sit down for an hour and just not um, come up with anything really of, of worth. Um, I tend to be kind of a nitpicky writer anyway. I'm definitely a person that will, you know, gloss over what they've read. And, and even though it's going to be changed in the end, probably during the editing process, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'll write a, rewrite a sentence multiple times. And I, I think it's one of those things that I would like to get better at is just uh, being okay with writing something that you're not, you don't really like and coming back later and fixing it up. Um, I'm terrible at it and I need to get better at it just to get more productive in general. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, I mean, just a couple of days ago, I spent, you know, at least was derailed for 15 minutes because I used the word ember in one sentence and amber in the next. And I was like, I can't, I can't use those too close together. They sound too similar. And yet the very same day I read it in a book in the same sentence, the two words, and I was like, okay, just keep going, Nick. Keep writing. Just keep going. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think I think I think to write a book, you need kind of need the attention span of a goldfish in some regards to just for, write and forget. Like, yeah. yeah, that was a that was a crappy sentence, but I'll catch it. That's future AJ's problem or future Nick's problem. Yeah, just I think going. that would help. And so I, yeah, that is hard. The most difficult part for me too is kind of letting letting that kind of thing slide. I think I maybe used to be better at it, um, mm -hmm. but for some reason, maybe it's maybe it's knowing that you know your work's going to be scrutinized. Uh, you know. And despite the fact that, you know, I've got beta readers and editors that are going to tell me if it's shit and help me anyway. So yeah. I don't know what my problem is. <laughs> yeah. So if you can divulge any information, we'd surely appreciate it. But book three of the band series, yeah. can you give us any tidbits? Yeah, well, I can give you like the basic, like the gist of it. It takes place, um, like the first book itself is inspired by a lot of 70s rock Uh the seven, the, more like 70s, the era of 70s rock merging into the 80s where everything was kind of going bigger and badder. Um, and then the second book is very, very obviously 80s, inspired by bands like Guns N' Roses and Pat Benatar and Queen and stuff like that. Um, so the third one kind of moves into the next era and the world itself moves into a new era. Um, it takes place uh, about 19, 20 years after the first book and about 14 years after the second. Um, it's called Outlaw Empire. Um, and yeah, it's inspired by kind of 90s music. And nice. in the same way that like the first book was, you know, because it was inspired by 70s music, had kind of a rambling, somewhat wholesome, um, epic kind of feel to it. And then the second one has very much um, kind of like a self, self-destructive, like go, 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 go. Everything's got to be better, louder than what came before it. Um, the third book, a lot of the music from the 90s, whether it's like grunge or, or early hip hop, um, is or like Rage Against the Machine um, mm. is very fueled by like anti-establishment anger and resentment and you know people sick of living with a boot on their neck so that's that's kind of the gist of this one and another question from the audience any update on a film or a video game based on your books uh, god I wish there was a video game based on them but uh, there isn't um, with the film stuff um, we're in like the third year of it being optioned and there's been like there was like a whole first round of like, you know, no, 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 maybe, 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 maybe. Uh, and then there was a second round of like, you know, the, there was a few solid people that were really interested in it. So they did up like a, a mock script and a mock season of what like a television series would look like. Uh, I got an alarming amount of input on it, which was really cool. Um, but at the same time, these things, you know, they just, you know, are like Sam through your fingers. They just, you know, it hasn't moved past that stage yet. And I don't like kind of those things. I don't really think about it because I'm, I was so you from so many years of getting rejection letters. I have no such thing as like, Oh, I hope this happens. It's just, yeah. there is none of that. I, it's out of sight, out of mind. If it happens, great. If it doesn't, 
so be it. Um, and so, I mean, you, I've heard, even heard about shows like getting, having showrunners and scripts and still falling through. So, um, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, it's been close. I think it would be a great TV show, you know, as I told the people when they, they let me have more input on it than I thought they would. I'm like, I don't really care. Like you could take the idea of mercenary bands as rock bands and just make a show out of it. You don't have to use my characters. You don't have to use my story. I think it would make a great show regardless. Throw a couple mm -hmm. guns of the song in there once in a while and you got it. Magic. Yeah. Um, so if you use my story, then great. Um, so yeah, it's hard to imagine it failing, and especially with movies like, um, you know, Thor Ragnarok or Thor Love and Thunder about to come out. You know, yeah. hopefully executives can look at that and see when you pair like fantasy action and rock and roll it is pretty magical so for sure yeah we'll so, see. So nothing concrete is the answer the, the one of my questions was related to this so like where, where do you stand on them i guess is like do you genuinely like when books get adapted to either tv shows or movie or you're genuinely displeased when that happens um i think i'm i don't like like I'm not one of those people that's a stickler for um, like whether they do it exactly because I know damn well that it's like it's a different beast, you know. Um, and yet, I mean, there's shows that I like and shows that I don't like. I mean, The Witcher, say like the first season of The Witcher, I wasn't that fond of because it 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 adhered very very much so to that first book, like very short story kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas I thought the second season of The Witcher was like almost as perfect as a fantasy television show as you can get. Um, it was just so cool. Um, yeah. And, um, but, but, but I kind of learned, I've learned in the last few years, at least not to be, you know, and I think it's part of being part of the book industry, seeing books meet different receptions, not to let my expectations get in the way of my enjoyment of something. And I think that's, that's what affects a lot of people when it comes to like the things that they quote unquote love. Like, there's so many Star Wars lovers out there. They're like, oh, right. which Star Wars movies do you like? And they like one of them or two of them. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, you don't really like Star Wars that much then. You like a couple of the movies. Yeah. Uh, whereas I'm just like, yes, I could find fault in plenty of like the plot holes and in, in, in movies, but you put a lightsaber in anything and it is better than something without a lightsaber in it. <laughs> the end. Yeah. You know, like, I don't care. You put the sound of a TIE fighter in there and I, it's great. You got me, yeah. you know? Um, so yeah, I, there's, you know, yeah, I think it's hit or miss. I would be precious maybe about some things, but like, like I grew up reading the wheel of time, but I don't care. And I hope the wheel of time is a, is a, a you know, that it does well. Um, but there's definitely obviously faults that I found and most people did find fault in that first season. Um, mm -hmm. But there's books that I love, like Jade city is getting adapted to a TV show. So I've heard. And God damn, they better do right by it because it's a great series of books and I'll be pissed if they don't. But yeah. at the same time, if they change like things, you know, as, fond, as long as like, I, you know, I'm not fond of Lee myself. So I just want to see it happen. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's different. I know when I had Anthony Ryan on the channel, he said he kind of dropped the hint that his books were getting adapted. Yeah. And I'm like, that would be interesting. I don't know if you've read Blood Song. No, uh, I haven't, but yeah. Okay. Well, the main character, like base, uh, actually, I actually don't want to give anything away. I'll just shut the hell up. <laughs> uh, but another question, would you ever write a script for an episode if there was an adaptation in series? Um, I don't think I would want to because it's just a whole new skill. It's a, not a skill set that I have currently. Um, I've been just recently kind of started to write. I'm doing like a comic that I, you know, I can't quite divulge the whole thing of it yet, but um, and writing even for comics is a whole new skill that you got to learn and, and it's not the same. So I think I'd rather just leave the screenwriting to the experts and I'd love to like be able to read it and add input to it. But, uh, mm. yeah, I think I would, I'm not the kind of person that wants to be too, too hands on. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I'd love for them to stay true to like the characters, but I don't care if they stay true to the story itself. It's, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Is there any genre of book that you would like to try your hand in writing that you haven't yet? Um, yeah, I think maybe like a very light, like kind of like sci not hard sci-fi. Like I love sci-fi books, you know, like that kind of stuff. So I, I would write, I like to write one without like rules where it came, became right, you know, apparent right off the bat. That's like, Oh, this guy doesn't know anything about space or how space works. Perfect. Am I still along for the ride? Good. 
Um, yeah. And I think, you know, it's an easier thing to do in this day and age, as you probably know, like people aren't as much going to bookstores and getting their books. Uh, they're finding them online. And, yeah. and so I think publishers used to not want an author to branch out because how are people going to see your fantasy book if it's, uh, if you've been writing sci-fi, but nowadays it's like, if, if you go to Amazon, your name's right there, click on other books, there they all are. So uh, I think it's easier now than ever to write that, you know, and I'm also huge, huge, like history buff. Um, so I wouldn't mind writing like almost like a military style fantasy, mm -hmm. but obviously with my kind of maybe voice and humor. Yeah. So, I mean, a good like military fantasy that kind of dabbles on horror if not is gunmetal gods i don't know if you've ever heard of it but I'm, I'm listening to the audiobook right now actually yeah i just finished the audiobook i loved it i thought uh i had he was my first guest on the channel and just he turned cool. turned me on to the book and i just yeah. i loved it oh wicked just, i'll go watch that uh, and then yeah i love the book so far it's great yeah he's just such an amazing job and another guy i had on is like i'm not a big sci-fi guy but another author I had on was Sean Crow, who wrote Godless Lands and yeah. Cyber, Cyber, and he has this cyberpunk series. Uh, Quenched in Blood's the first one. I'm reading it right now, and it's turning me on to sci-fi. I'm like, man, yeah. Have I have I been missing out on an entire genre of great books my whole life? Oh, there's some crazy good sci-fi books out there. Um, and mo in modern sci-fi, even the hard sci-fi, I feel as long as it's you know if it's relatively popular, it's because it's palatable to people you know mm -hmm. um so yeah people are sci-fi is getting a lot better at having relatable characters whereas in the past i feel you just had these big concepts and kind of cardboardy characters whereas now you're getting real character driven sci-fi which is awesome yeah yeah excuse me and then is there where do you stand what makes what's more i guess critical for a book success a damn good plot or damn good characters uh, ultimately, I think it's damn good characters um, because, you know, if you get a if you get a great plot with shitty characters, then you, people just don't care about what happens to them and it kind of falls flat. Whereas if you get really good characters, they could sit around, you know, whatever, throwing balls at a wall and you'd be as long as they're well written characters, you'd kind of be attention, be interested in them. And, and books have come along like. Uh, the audiobook I listened to before this was Legends and Lattes mm -hmm. um, by Travis Baldry, as I believe is the author's name. And it's like, it's literally about this like retired orc adventurer who's opening a coffee shop. And there is no big battle. There is no dark Lord. It's mostly about, you know, figuring out where to put the espresso machine and what kind of lighting to have. And yet it's so compelling to listen to. And it's just wholesome as hell. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, it was a, such a good story full of great characters, but without like your classic fantasy plot that you'd expect. Um, it still obviously had twists and turns, but uh, yeah, it was a damn good book. So I think characters. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100% there. I think you can just have any, you could just, yeah, read a book. I think Anthony Ryan does it in one of his books. He has, for a whole chapter, he has his characters sitting around waiting for the big battle and they just sit around and talk about it for a whole chapter yeah. before it happens. And it's just, it's compelling as hell. Yeah, I think readers I mean, love that kind of stuff. Like, there's it's definitely something to be said for keeping momentum going, but having those little moments where characters are just doing regular human stuff, and you know, I think people love it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a good scene. And then, would you ever want to co-author with another author? Uh, nobody would want to co-author with me. They'd be <laughs> like. Are you fucking kidding me? You just what you were, you worked for four hours and you wrote fifteen words, and I'm like I, I wrote negative fifteen words. I actually rewrote this sentence eight times in a row. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be able to. I don't think. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I mean, the, I am co-writing a comic with someone right now, but that's a very different beast. It's much easier, obviously. Um, but yeah, co-writing a book, it would be just be yeah, it would be god awful. I mean, I, I really love the idea. I, I love like sitting with authors and doing, having some writing sessions. Like me and Ben Galley had a few, uh, this author, Christian Cameron, um, you know, we had a few nice writing sessions and, but their productivity outstrips mine every time. So yeah, it's a nice idea, but impractical. So seeing as Kings of the Wild and the whole band series is heavily influenced by music, do you write with music in the background or do you just kind of have the mental idea of the, the decades of the music? Um, yeah, I do write with music in the background all the time. Um, 
with with Kings of the Wild, I was able to listen to 70s rock and write at the same time because it's not too much like in your face. It's very, you know, there's 17 minute guitar solos or, you know, Pink Floyd albums that have like eight words the whole time, you know. Um, so it's very, very like conducive to writing. But writing Bloody Rose was a lot more difficult because 80 songs, you know, they went from like 20 minutes long to radio ready four minute songs. And they're like, like, listen to how heartbroken I am. Listen to how much I love you. Listen to how angry I am. So they're, they're, you can't really listen to them while writing. You can listen to them while doing other stuff and draw inspiration from them. But I, with Bloody Rose, I switched to um, like synth wave because it's so, it's so 80s. Mm-hmm. And, you know it's easy to write too and it's got lots of action and lots of cool downtime so it's pretty good and then with with uh with book three it's kind of the same because it's you're listening to a lot of like hip-hop and rage against the machine you can't write while listening to rage against the machine that's kind of yeah. crazy um and so uh, there's like you know put it like a lo-fi playlist that's got like hip-hop beat to it kind of thing and it's got that same kind of feeling um and you can do that with <laughs> you know, having the lyrics in your head. Right. Makes sense. Once I, I think, I think if you listen to an album and it seems crazy, cause I used to always just listen to like epic one hour, three hour, five hour, 10 hour epic playlists. Mm. Uh, but nowadays if I listen to like, there's some certain hip hop albums out there like Illmatic um, or like only built for Cuban links that I have listened to so many times that I can just put it on full blast in my like speakers and just like, it's just background to me now. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, I I write with music uh, just because uh, before we went live, I, still, I went to first school for sound engineering, and I'm a yeah. big music nerd. Played in band for years, uh, but like I listen to like video game soundtracks. Oh, awesome! Yeah, so like, The Witcher soundtracks or uh, Ghost of Tsushima, which is more, which is another side project I have going, a more uh, Japanese inspired fantasy. Yeah, I put that one on. Yeah, whatever. So yeah, it, those soundtracks just really get me going, and. I think it's kind of nice because with the video games, whenever there's a boss battle in the game I, and there's a big battle in the book, I'll just put that song on loop and yeah. it just keeps up the intensity. Yeah. I do the same once in a while when I'm in need of deep inspiration, I'll throw on final fantasy soundtracks of one sort or another. And I, I still, to this day, I'm playing final fantasy 14 quite often and it's music is just ludicrously good. So yeah. It's just yeah, they I think for The Witcher, they they spent so much money on the soundtrack. Like they actually went to like the uh the Poland, capital of Poland. Warsaw. Warsaw? Yeah. yeah, I just had to think about it for a minute. Uh they went to like the actual like Philharmonic Symphony and recorded yeah. it all there for their and like it just it that's why I love it so much. It just translates so well. Yeah, it's got good music. And especially like if you get one of those, especially video game music, because it's so immersive and it's made to be immersive especially mm-hmm. for something like the witcher um you know it's it's perfect i think for writing yeah Whereas, yeah although i'd love it final fantasy is probably less immersive and more just like going for like huge huge epic bombastic you know full choir kind of pieces awesome bullshit yeah yeah and then i asked that question already oh yes the dreaded question i ask every author on my channel that makes no sense I'm taking a poll for every author. So would you rather fight an orangutan once a year or a chicken every time you get into your house? Um, I'd rather fight an orangutan once a year. I think you're the third author to just pick that choice. Everyone else has gone with the chicken. Really? Yeah. I guess if you got good enough, you could just kick the, give the chicken a kick or something like that and put it out of commission. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I'd rather fight an orangutan once a year. You'd know it was coming. You could build up to it. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's usually the argument. I'm torn. I like. I every time someone answers, I'm like, ah, I see their point of view, and I yeah. want to change my answer. But yeah, you still want the hassle. You're you're carrying ghosts <laughs> in the house. You don't want a chicken. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, I think that's all my questions. Um, so thank you so much, Nick, for coming on my little channel and answering all. Thanks for asking. Questions. Man. Appreciate it. Yeah. I really, I'm excited to start Bloody Rose once I get finished the current book I'm on because that's been on my TBR for a while. Awesome. And then, so yeah, I'm excited to go back and see the band and excited for, is there a release date for uh, Outlaw Empire? No, or not, not yet. yet. Still, still working on it. So still working on it. Okay, perfect. Well, I'll keep my eyes peeled for that when it's released. Well, while you're reading Bloody Rose, there's a Spotify playlist for both books. So, oh, perfect. Mindset. Yeah. I'll have to definitely check that out.
Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for watching. And once again, thanks Nick for joining me. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye.